Hi, Phil Chandler here, and today's video is going to be about setting up a hive for a swarm. And this is the hive we're going to be using. As you can see, it's got a, uh, an eco floor, and it's got a couple of followers. It's got entrances towards the end, which is my favoured position these days, and I'll talk to you about that. Uh, in fact, there's entrances both ends. Um, there's a remains of a, a tub that was used for feeding. Just put that one to one side. You can see there's bits of old comb and stuff in the bottom. Now then, let's make some sense of all this. Let's start by emptying out all the spare woodwork. Here we go. Right, everything's gone. Now then, what have we got at the bottom here is a piece I will show you from the other side, from underneath. Here we go. It's six inch, uh, what's that, 150 millimeter plastic guttering. Um, yes, I know it's made from PVC and that's naughty and everything like that, but it does have a long life. It does hopefully um, do the job that we want it to do and we'll carry on doing that for many years to come. There may be better alternatives and I will be testing some other alternatives. Whether they're better or not remains to be seen, of course. But let's look, talk about entrances briefly. Here you can see three entrance holes towards one end and the distance from this hole to the end is about 150 millimeters. At this end of the hive on the opposite side, in other words the side nearest me, you can see exactly the same arrangement. In other words it is symmetrical about a, if you like, a vertical axis. So, you, it, it, so if you had a, a rod down the middle and rotated it uh, around that rod then it would be identical um, in both from both sides, although of course the the, hi, huh, the hinge lid would would be different because it would be on the opposite side if you get my meaning. Okay, but anyway, the point here is that we want to set this hive up in a way that the bees will hopefully um, find beneficial to them, and there's a number of things we can start doing. This eco floor material is very dry. So we're probably going to want to add some moisture to it at some stage. Um, and in fact, it's, the, the level of the uh, material is actually too low. It's too, it's too far down. The bottom of the follower board is not going to touch it. Therefore, bees can get underneath the follower boards. And therefore, if bees can, so can other things like wasps. And we don't want those, do we? So here we have a bag of um, sawn up timber because just over there um, a beech tree came down and that's been uh, logged and, and, and cut up. So we've got a nice supply of local sawdust and shavings and general bits and pieces, which is going to be added to the, to the eco floor. I'm also going to add, that's probably enough, I'm also going to add stuff that you may have heard me talking about before, in fact I may have overdone this slightly, so we'll just take a handful or two out. Um, I'm going to add some, this isn't an ad for Morrison's by the way, it's highly coincidental. We're going to add some birch bark. Now, birch bark um, contains a uh, resinous substance which uh, the bees are known to go for apparently people have seen bees taking this resinous substance from birch trees in order to make their propolis and so we're going to give them a bit of a supply right here in the hive there are other reasons for adding birch bark um, birch is a tree that uh, contains some a substance called betulinic acid which has uh, a number of, uh, of, of known useful properties which may be beneficial to bees. It also contains methyl salicylate which is um, which used to be used if any of you that have read R.O.B. Manley's books will know that he used to use little bottles of methyl salicylate inside his hives with a little wick um, coming out of the top and that, that was to vaporize the methyl salicylate um, such that the bees in winter would be protected to some extent from Nosema, Nosema apis, which is um, a protozoan, I believe, I think is that is that's the, the correct ter term. Um, but methyl salicylate apparently protects rather well against 
Nosema. So that's another good reason for having some of it available to the bees actually inside the hive, I think. The other thing I'm going to put in here is some bark from another tree that has come down and it's, um, hmm, I'm not sure what it is. It might be a larch, I'm not absolutely sure, but it's um, a nice kind of mossy bark and bees love moss um, because it holds, at least it, 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 um, it remains damp. It grows on damp surfaces and um, it, it is, seems to be one of their favorite ways of getting moisture. So I'm going to give them some of that as well. And that's going to go inside the hive. Okay, now, so now we've got a pretty uneven surface for them to, to, to bed down the, um, to bed down the, the, the follower boards. Um, but I don't think that's very important right now. The main thing to do next is to uh, define the space uh, in which the bees are going to live. Now, this entrance here is the one that's facing away from me. You can see the lids uh, folded down at the moment and uh, that, that, so that's the side we want them to be coming in at. This other entrance is really for doing things like making splits which I'll talk to you about probably in another video. Let's talk about follower boards. Now these follower boards are incomplete. They, they will bed down into the, into the floor material but because they haven't got a top bar attached to them um, they're not going to be stable. They're going to they're going to kind of rock around like this. So we need to fix that problem. Now I've got some a couple of old top bars here, which are a bit on the narrow side for my liking. These these are my these are my current um, top bars. There's a bit of cobweb on there. These are my current top bars um, as yet unburnt. Um, so they're going to be. We've got a bunch of those we're going to be using. Um, those are the main ones that the bees are going to be building their combs on. There's a couple of old bars here with, with bits of comb on, which is a bit raggy and ancient, but we'll clean those up in a little bit and use them. Um, the other thing I want to find is another, that's a good top bar, is another one that we can use for the other follow board. Oh, there's one down here. Okay, I kind of arrived here and kind of threw everything out. Uh, has my tools waiting to be used. Right, here's the other follower board. Now, theoretically, these followers are identical. Uh, they, they are reasonably close, okay? But again, this one is going to flap around, so we need to put a bar on that. So we're going to screw a top bar to the top surface of that follower board, and we're going to do the same with that follower board, and that will complete the... Um, the arrangement for those except for one of these follow boards in fact this one is going to have a hole drilled in it for reasons that I will come to so I'm going to now take a little break from filming and I'm just going to use my blow lamp to scorch the inside of the hive I'm going to do the same thing with the um, with the two follow boards I'm going to screw the bars on the follow boards and then I'll be back as if by magic Okay, I've done all those things and now I'm back. And you can see that the sides of the hive have been scorched with a blow lamp. The sides, the facings, uh, faces, should I say, of the floorboards have been scorched. Now, just one thing here. Um, you'll see the, here that I've used quite a thick, uh, it's about an inch thick uh, piece of um, Douglas fir to make these followers. Normally I make followers out of plywood, heavy, fairly heavy plywood, say about 19 to 20 millimeter uh, ply. The reason being that if you use thinner timber than this, you will often get warping. Um, and what happens is that the side of the, the face of the um, follower closest to the bees absorbs water from the from the hive atmosphere and then it it will curve away from that side so it'll 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 warp and, and end up this side here will end up lifting away from the uh, from the colony and it will cease to be a vertical top bar which means that it will have uh, leaks effectively both for bees and for things that predate bees so um, either use thick timber like this or use plywood and you shouldn't have any problems like that with a bit of luck now you'll notice the uh, the floor here. I've I've just put um, the the material in loosely. There's wood chips. There's um, birch bark and bits of uh, whatever bark that is. 
uh, with some moss on it. The sorts of things that you might find in uh, at the bottom of a hollow tree. And actually we could sort of test that theory because right here there happens to be a hollow tree. And if you look in the bottom of it, uh, there's all manner of detritus. Uh, and if you look up here, you can see um, rotting wood here. Uh, so this tree is uh, probably not got long for this world. Although it's pretty sturdy, I think it'll be here for a, uh, a year or two yet, but it's a, a beach and they're not uh, deep-rooted trees and they, do, they are subject to rot once, uh, once they get a, once the, the rot gets a hold on them. Um, and that's what happened to this one here, of course, which is, uh, which was once a, a, a rather magnificent tree, uh, now being um, returned to uh, nature by moles and, and fungi. Um, as well as being chopped up for firewood. Anyway, back to the job in hand. So, I want to show you how to set this up for a swarm. That's the purpose of this um, exercise. You'll notice that I've screwed uh, top bars, old top bars, onto the, uh, onto the tops of these followers, so they are now suspended, effectively, from the, from the edges of the... Um, what do we call these runners, I suppose, they're, they're suspended rather than being held um, up by the floor itself, if you get my meaning. The reason for that is obviously that they will now not um, fall over. Right. Uh, the other thing you might notice here is that I've got two bars covering this gap. Now, this brings us to the, um, the notion of why do you need a hole in the middle of a follower? Well, the purpose of that hole is to allow bees to get through to a feeder which you would locate in this space here. Now I generally leave about um, a four inch or a hundred millimeter gap here um, and often I will make a board specifically to just to cover that space because when you've got your feeder in there um, you want to keep obviously things like wasps out of it. The other thing you can do is just put um, bars in that space. Uh, in this case just two bars so that's only a three inch gap. That's okay. The other reason for doing this is um, this kind of brings me to the to the uh, the notion of the the tandem follower board um, principle of top bar beekeeping which um, which is something I, I kind of figured out and then introduced when I wrote The Barefoot Beekeeper, which is this idea that if you enclose the bees between two followers, okay, both of which are movable, this one's not sitting down, okay, both of which are movable, then you can very quickly and very easily check both sides of the colony. And so if the, let's say that there was a colony in here, here's their bars, put some bars in there. Right, here's our colony and we want to check the, shall we say, the brood end of the colony. Now the brood end is going to be, in almost all cases, close to the entrance, which we know is here. And so if we want to check the brood end of the colony, we can simply move this follower away and there they are, right there. Well, they're not obviously, but you know, there, there they would be if they were in there. Okay, so this, this is why you need a gap here. Okay, what you should never do is run this right up against the end of the colony, at the end of the hive, sorry, because if you do that, uh, then you'll never be able to lift it out. Well, you, okay, I'll correct that. You can lift it out, but you may do damage in the process because the bees may be um, already you know, adhering to this uh, follower. They might start building comb on it or something, in which case you're gonna drag it out. Here we are, look. Uh, let me demonstrate. If you try to drag that out there and it's got any comb on it, you're going to, um, well, at, at best, best case scenario is you're going to mangle a few bees, right? So we want to avoid that situation. So always have a gap between the follower and the end of the hive, all right? This is another good reason, I believe. I mean, I know some people will disagree with this and, and you're welcome to do so, of course. Um, there's no, uh, there's no absolute rules about this, but the reason I use side entrances rather than entrances in the end of the hive is exactly for that reason. If you can imagine, here's your colony, right? You've got, a, you've got an entrance hole here, or three holes, or however many you want, here. Your bees are coming in and out here, right? 
here's all your bars. The colony might be occupying, you know, half the, the length of the hive. Um, let's put a few more bars in to emulate that. Right, here's your colony, and you've got one follower board at this end, okay? Now then, you want to inspect the brood. What are you going to do? You can't come over here. You can't lift this bar out because it might have attachments. And in any case, it's going to disturb the bees because here's the entrance is right here and they're going to be, you know, going at least going past this comb uh, in numbers and therefore you're going to disturb them, right? So we know the brood is going to be here, this end of the hive. So that means we've got to start here and we've got to move every single bar with its comb all back here somewhere out of the way in order to check the brood okay that's a lot of work it's a lot of time and above all it's a lot of disturbance to the bees so we don't want to really want to be doing that okay so my suggestion and this is this is something i suggested well who knows how many years ago was it now i wrote that book uh, 15 16 years ago maybe um, this is something that has i think most people kind of understand by now but there are still people using end entrances now obviously if you want to use an end entrance for your own reasons that's entirely up to you you know this is not a law uh, but um, I just wanted to point out that that there are distinct advantages in using two follower boards and an entrance um, towards one end okay rather than at the end that's the important thing so back to our subject um, which is, if you remember, setting up a hive for bees, for, to attract bees, either to attract a swarm, yeah? So if, you've, if, you've, uh, if you haven't started beekeeping yet, you've built yourself a hive, or you've had somebody build you one, or you've bought one, you've put this in your garden and you want to get some bees into it. Well, of course you do. Now, there's a number of things you can do to make this more attractive to bees. Um, you can the best, probably the best thing of all you can do is to find another top bar beekeeper um, in your area and um, talk to them nicely and persuade them to give you um, a bar that has already had, there's a spider nest, um, a bar that's already had bees building comb on it, like this one. And it doesn't have to be a full comb, this is obviously broken off. Um, it doesn't have to be a full comb. If it's got a little bit of comb on it, or even just a little bit of starter wax on it, that will help, believe me. That bar can go right up against that follower, and when the scout bees turn up to check this out, which they will, um, then they've got a little bit of wax there, and they go, well, we can assume that they go, oh, bees have been in here before, it must be a good place to live. You know, I know that's anthropomorphic projection, but what can you do? So that kind of thing, that's going to attract bees. And th I think bees actually do quite like this burnt surface too. That's, that's just my perception of it. But you can improve this, I think, by getting hold of a ball of wax. Uh, gosh, my hands are dirty now. Um, <laughs> you can get hold of a, if you can get hold of a ball of wax, beeswax, from a beekeeper, preferably a treatment-free, chemical-free beekeeper, then, and just rub it around the inside of the hive here, rub it on the woodwork, if it's got propolis in it, then so much the better, uh, because propolis has a, uh, a stronger smell than wax. Wax doesn't really smell it very much until you burn it. Um, so rub that around the inside of the hive. Make it smell like bees have lived in it before. You know, that's the important thing. Bees, nothing attracts bees like places that bees have been already. Um, so anything with beeswax on it, anything with propolis on it is good. Uh, there's, a, there's a motley selection of, of, of top bars here, but what I'm going to do is just put a bunch of top bars in, some of which have got bits of comb on, some haven't. They're all roughly the right width, but a couple of them are maybe a little bit on the narrow side, but we'll, we'll skirt over that for the moment. Um, so what I'm doing is setting this hive up to be attractive to bees. Now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, let's call it around ten top bars okay that with a follower board at the end will give you enough space to attract a good size swarm 10 to a dozen top bars is absolutely fine 
Uh, that's the kind of space that bees like to occupy. Pretty much the same thing applies if you uh, catch a swarm somewhere else and bring it to your hive and uh, want to put it into your hive and I'll, I, I think I may already have done a video on that but if not I'll do another one soon. Um, you should probably use about the same number of bars so you know eight, 8 to 12 but you know more like 10 or 12 bars makes a nice volume makes a nice space for the bees to occupy. Um, this part of the hive here is not going to be occupied um, immediately, obviously, um, but as the colony expands, and, and hopefully it will expand nicely beyond this, um, we can then move the follower board ahead of the bees and uh, make sure they've got plenty of room, add more bars in the gap, and um, all will, will be well. And you may even get to a point where the bees are pretty much filling the hive. Now you may decide you want to do splits before that time, before that point arrives. We'll talk about that sort of thing uh, as the season goes on. It's now uh, right at the end of March. So uh, I'm, given the weather, it's pretty cold at the moment. We've got a northeasterly wind, which is really quite unpleasant. Um, given the temperatures, I'm not expecting to see a swarm for at least another week to two weeks. Um, it's been a quite a chilly, uh, spring and, and a long wet winter. Um, the bees are making the most of what they can find at the moment of course as they always do and uh, around here this is a this is a, not the same apiary I was in the other day by the way this is a different apiary um, so they will be uh, they will be doing their best that that hive over there is occupied there's a colony being in there for at least three I think possibly four years now with virtually nothing being done to them because they're actually quite stroppy bees uh, so nobody's nobody's really gone near them in that time um, so they've been left to their own devices in fact let's go over there right now and just see if there are bees bringing pollen in because there were earlier on uh, where are we there we go there's the one come out there's no one come back it's not fantastically busy at the moment because um, it's not warm out. It's a bit of a wind. Um, uh, there are there are a few bees coming back. There were more earlier. There were there were some with uh, with pollen on their legs coming in earlier. So I know they're good. They've come through another winter. No treatment. No interference. No management. Nothing. They've looked after themselves. So, it's a nice spot this. It's uh, reasonably sheltered from most directions. Uh, the, most of the weather comes from over there in the southwest. At the moment we've got, a, as I said, a north northeasterly wind, which is unusual. Uh, but again, we're, we're pretty, pretty much sheltered all the way around, so it's, uh, it's okay. Because the inside of this hive is rather dry, uh, it's all dry sawdust and dry birch bark, I'm actually going to moisten it and I'm going to use some birch sap that I have collected from, um, well, a birch tree, obviously. And as you can see, there's, um, I don't know, a couple of litres in there. And I'm just going to put some of it on to the floor here. Not too much, just enough to moisten it. Because I think um, a bit of moisture is probably going to be a good thing. Um, the bees themselves obviously produce moisture in the, uh, in the act of bringing nectar into the hive. But I have found that these floors do have a tendency to dry out. Uh, so I, I think pre-moistening it might not be a bad thing. And that does put some birch uh, sap into the floor material which means that the bees can access um, whatever it is in the birch sap that they, uh, they they can make use of and let's hope that's going to be beneficial for them. So uh, I think that pretty much does it for now. Um, if you have any questions, anything I haven't mentioned that I should have mentioned, uh, then perhaps uh, comment below just going to mention this briefly as it's there. Uh, this um, has a couple of uses actually. 
One is um, during the winter I like to leave a lump of fondant um, above the bees where they can get at it and I do that I have a special bar which I didn't have with me for each um, colony has a, has a bar which has um, some some actually have holes drilled near the edge and some have a cutaway at the edge so that the bees can actually come up from below and then I put a lump of fondant on over the hole and then I put this um, this kind of thing over the over the fondant to stop it drying out um, here, right now I've got a, a bit of a motley selection of bars here at different heights so um, it's not lying flush but it should lay flush with the uh, with the top bars and also in the winter in fact all year round I always have insulation this is an old polyester pillow and that sort of thing uh, and obviously if you've got a feeder a, a fondant feeder in there you need to put the insulation over the top of the feeder under the roof and that will help to keep them cozy during the winter insulation elsewhere i think is largely irrelevant the thickness of the timber here see that's an inch thick uh, douglas fir the thickness of the timber um, protects the bees pretty much and in any case they they don't mind the cold so much as long as they've got food so obviously you know priority is to make sure they have um, a good supply of uh, honey going into winter okay that's enough for this video um, there will be more and as I say if you've got questions uh, or observations um, then please add them below subscribe like all those kinds of things and uh, I shall see you in the uh, I shall see you in the next video